you have to uh, bring out the money from the buyer's pocket and you have to get it. Often thought, I mean, I would love to have my studio in Kolkata, actually. And that has been removed. And I'm not at all happy because you can't deny the colonial history. You have to accept it. So are you ready? Yeah, ready. Okay, here we go. Hi. Hello again. Hello again. This is Evil O from Udaipur, Oazo X Oazo. And today I'm speaking with, with somebody whose art I've admired for a long time. He's based in Kolkata. He's represented, I believe, by Sakshi Gallery. And his name is Anurban Mitra. How are you, Anurban? I'm fine, I'm fine. You're fine? Yeah. Good. It's hot there in Kolkata today, yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Too. You don't want to turn off your fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to just get you talking a little bit. I, I'm titling this, what did I title it? The Punch of Pop. Yeah. And I always think of your artwork as being somewhat pop-like, although I don't know if you were inspired by yeah. Andy Warhol and people, but it's got sort of a pop overtone. Yeah. So yeah. why don't you just talk a little bit about how you came to this um, this style? How's that? Like, uh, when I started with in my college and during the last years of bachelor in Shantiniketan, uh, my teacher was uh, Shanchan Ghosh. Uh, he's a very famous uh, performance installation based artist. And he actually uh, introduced me th to this kind of a pop art, which is uh, very much uh, based in near Kolkata and uh, some kind of an Indian overtone. Like before that, uh, I used to do in different languages, I used to experiment in different languages, like the folk art, the dokra art, and I used to do different kinds of uh, idioms, practice, uh, like when I'm studying nature study, I used to do in the realistic mode as well as I used to do it in a folk art mode, mode like on the Madhubani or say the dokra art or something like that where uh, different types of idioms, I used to experiment with different kinds of idioms. And later I got hold of, like um, during the fourth year of my study in Shantaniketan uh, to the pop art, there was a book from America. And um, there, for the first time I saw that how you can actually introduce a toffee cover or a book cover or a poster into your uh, art into your painting like before that I had no idea of the, how a pop art is and uh, naturally these kinds of materials got introduced into my painting through this uh, particular book of pop art uh, and later I came to know how these artists actually experimented with these kind of uh, locally available uh, images from the immediate surroundings. Uh, so you were you were inspired by Western pop art to yes. some extent, but then you've brought in all sorts of Indian motifs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, before that, uh, after that, I started collecting these kinds of toffee covers and cake covers, pastry covers, and uh, pan covers, and uh, all kinds of locally made. Uh, plastics we, we uh, made up with those wrappers and and those were they have a different kind of color color intensity different kind of a uh, luminosity which uh, I, I was taking heed of like there is a typical almanac Bengali almanac printed cover which has a matte kind of a uh, very cheap quality red printed woodblock print kind of a cover 
and uh, my teacher slowly introduced me to these kinds of like i was realized that i was not staying in a metropolitan city like delhi or bombay and suddenly uh, slowly realized that i need to reflect my immediate surroundings my immediate uh, pop images which were available in shantiniketan and in and around kolkata uh, more concentrated towards the eastern india so what specific imagery do you start so okay you're doing tribal and different like yeah. commercial type things that you see around kolkata can you just re- reference a few like, particularly uh, like you've uh, used uh, uh, first when i started uh, painting in the mark and the bachelor's early years uh, i was from a very urban background i uh, studied in a missionary school and i was taught in a very uh, you know english medium type school where we were taught the bible new testament and old testament and this kind of things and okay and those so they made you do a lot of bible reading yeah, oh yeah. my god okay bible reading and everyday prayer and the pastor used to come to our school and explain. but you're still a hindu correct yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> and uh, at, that was mandatory there was a uh, from class 3 to uh, i think 4 years we had to study and give exams on based on the bible and all the stories and gospels and all those things so uh, i was born brought up in a very eclectic way where you are actually hindu and you are practicing your parents are practicing all these bengali cultures hindu bengali cultures and at the same time your school is teaching you all these things so i was in a uh, you know dichotomy where different realities actually coalesce and uh, contradict in a way and these these were there and uh, i after before joining art college i was a science student and from a science background before join, going to shantiniketan i had a typical science background and i used to see the world in a very objective way where you see a flower you see a tree i used to tell my teachers and students classmates that you know the, this is the petiole this is the there are several petals and this number of anthers and stigmas and all this kind of things so uh, i was actually living in a very um, in a multiple reality multiple existence where you were a science student you were joining the arts and you um, upon uh, entering shantiniketan which is actually a very rural area and uh, from the urban you were entering a rural area and you were confronting this different kind of experiences which is actually contradictory so uh, this kind of multiple realities multiple ex- existence i was living in and i was, and I was when i first went to shantiniketan i saw that the dokra art you know the metal casting dokra yeah yeah art. okay i was so engaged with uh, this kind of art i had never seen it in calcutta uh, you know the calcutta they it was not available ready, readily and uh, i started collecting these dokra dokra then uh, i have around 200 250 pieces of dokra oh my god that's a huge collection yeah That's and, a huge collection. Okay. And, uh, suppose when I'm going to nature, I'm studying in a naturalistic way, and when I'm returning to my studio or hostel, I used to take the same motif of a pig. Maybe I've seen a pig in a in a village, and I used to uh, transform the motif of the pig in a in in the Dokra language. So, okay. Yeah. Th- these kind of Uh, exchange was happening, and I, at the same time, I was using soft um, Microsoft Paint Word and and paint those, and I was pixelating and drawing those simplified drawings with the same thing. Your your practice has always been pretty canvas based, though, right? You basically yeah. you're using oil or acrylic on canvas, Absolutely, yeah? yeah. Acrylic Absolutely. on canvas. Absolutely, okay. yeah. and so these kind of multiple realities confront i was confronted by this kind of multiple realities multiple existences and and as the bachelor's end of bachelor was coming i realized how it can be put in a 
single canvas into a single frame where right. we address different realities within a single surface. And there was several uh, postmodern uh, seminar going on, going on around that time. My teachers were uh, taking seminars. Gita Kapoor was coming at the time as a uh, faculty. Uh, and uh, Vivan Sundram was coming at the time. And, uh, right. and uh, at the same time, we had Chinese classes, Chinese painting classes. And our teacher was uh, showing us how the Chinese artists were actually using postmodern language. Uh, they were uh, taking quotations from earlier periods and using them in their paintings, like how to paint a hill. So you, you pretty much embraced the postmodern um, ideas, at least on a surface level you did yeah, in your yeah. uh, on surface work. level, I did uh, embrace it. And uh, after that, I realized how this can be used. Like I was using, juxtaposing the pop art with the uh, folk art and with the pixelated and uh, different kinds of genres. And uh, this was how I started and I was collecting all these uh, pan masala packets and uh, cake covers and all these things. And slowly I was influenced by the Bombay boys at that time. Art in oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the Bombay boys yeah. show. Were I, you a I, part of that? No, you weren't a part of that, but you no, were. No, no, no. I was just a student at the time and Art India magazine was uh, much hyped. Uh, that was, that yeah. was Bose and Rias and the whole group, Sudarshan, they were all in and, that original uh, show. Those interactions were taking place at the time and uh, uh, Slowly, this postmodern thing crept in, and Shanchan Ghosh, my teacher, uh, did a very good class on how to do a narrative painting. I, I mean, how to narrate a story. There was a right. wonderful, wonderful class where he told us to take up a literary piece, maybe a folk art, or maybe a, I mean, maybe a folk uh, story, or a, or a poem, or a haiku poem or, or anything, maybe a Tagore song to paint with. And he used to teach us how to, uh, how to tell a story, basically. So, so do you see those large canvases that you're known for as basically narrative then? Are they yes. narrative? They are, okay. Are there, are, is there a way they can be read like from left to right yes. or right to left? Yes. yes. There is, okay. And uh, they are uh, certainly, and uh, I started to realize that uh, I'm very much interested by the narrative painting. And uh, then he, Shamchan, was actually helped me in uh, how, to, how to get with it. And uh, later there was a class on semiotics and he did a wonderful, I mean, he could see traces of uh, these sign making possibilities within my painting how to make a sign and uh, semiotics. And he later taught me how, uh, how to read those things, how to theoreticize your painting. And, and uh, so I started, uh, slowly developed a language which was um, having different signs within one painting. And the pop thing crept within it. And uh, this actually helped. Yeah, your paintings have done well. I mean, when did you join Sakshi? Were you any in any shows before Sakshi? I mean, no. I was I was browsing the internet a little just this afternoon. Notice you've been in Christie's auctions. Yeah, you've yeah. been in some international museum yeah, shows. You've actually, done quite well. You've done yeah. quite well. Uh, after in two thousand, I think uh, I was in Masters at the time, and Gita went there for I think to meet the Shomnath Hall. Uh, actually, he passed away at that time, and uh, she went to meet uh, I mean, Reba Hor, uh, um, the wife. Samna Thor has always been one of my favorites. Yes. He's, he's and, very uh, high on my list. Yeah. And at the time, uh, Gita came to meet her, and at the time, we got introduced. Actually, uh, R. Shiv Kumar introduced me to her uh, because uh, R. Shiv, I've learned a lot lot from R. Shiv Kumar, he has been an inspiration for me and he actually helped me in this postmodern thing like he was teaching at the time how to read Abhinindranath Tagore's paintings, the Arabian Nights and uh, that was a great help for me 
and later uh, uh, Arbyan uh, Avanindranath's uh, recent book uh, was launched. Uh, it was uh, Khuddu Jatra. There was okay. a wonderful book. Yeah, during his last days he did, and it was totally in a postmodern language. He used to cut those clippings. Uh, I mean, it, it was an artist book. And I was so excited. So when you think of postmodernism, because I think of postmodernism more in terms of like Foucault and mm -hmm. the philosophy of it, mm -hmm. which was heavily related to Marxism, and mm -hmm. it's sort of a whole philosophy of deconstructing, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Do you approach it that way or do you approach it more uh, as sort of a stylistic level no, uh, using stylistic. irony? And no, I, I actually approach it, approached it from a multiple language where I can introduce different realities. I okay, that. that I understand. Yeah, that was the interaction because before that I had no idea what was postmodernism and uh, I was actually confused. It's a hard thing to define and you know I, I actually think I use a lot of postmodernism in the yeah. miniatures that I make with Rakesh, mm -hmm. although I sort of rant and rave against postmodernism <laughs> a lot, as you notice on Facebook. Yes, yes, but yes. actually, postmodernism has been a part of my own practice, yes, you know, I, I maybe know subliminally. So, so uh, these things actually crept into my language making. And uh, during my master's, I was introduced to Gita. Shakshi, Shakshi from Shakshi Gallery, and yeah. uh, she actually introduced me to her gallery, and later we did. And now I'm working with them. Yeah, Gita's a wonderful person. She's really a sweetheart. Yeah. I really liked her. She handled me for a while, but I left to go with Abhishek Potter at Tasfir, <laughs> you know. But I felt bad telling Gita that because I liked her. <laughs> I still like her. Anyway. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. So your work, how, you know, you know, this is a question about, I just want to ask you about being an artist in Kolkata in West Bengal, because um, like it or not, the art scene always seems so centered upon the tale of two cities, Mumbai and Delhi. Mm -hmm. And Kolkata always gets left out of the mix Yes. Um, just as much as Bangalore, amazingly. In fact, sometimes I think Bangalore gets more attention than uh, Kolkata does. I don't understand that because fabulous artists are in Kolkata and Bengal. Because, you know, how, how, do you, how do you fight that? How do you counteract that being sort of, you know? Yeah, this, you're co correct because, you know, the, uh, the Kolkata artists, those who are based in the Eastern India, they actually didn't address the urbanization issue. Most of the Delhi artists and Bombay artists, they addressed urbanization, urban phenomena, or they criticized it, or they addressed it in a certain way. But Kolkata artists basically uh, didn't address the urbanization issue at all. From a larger perspective view, if you see uh, Ganesh Pine and the others, I think that that's the reason they were left out of the grand narrative of India, where Indian art, whenever you address the, uh, the Indian art, they will say that the last 20 years, artists address urbanization from issues of urbanization from Bombay and Delhi, both. But the Bengal scene was basically Shanti Niketan centered. So you had a more of a rural kind of yeah. theme always going on there. Yeah. That, that, that's the point, that's the point. Yeah. How do you feel that? I mean, do you find you have to be much more active on the internet yes, and all of that, you know, yes, to be... Active on the internet, I, I mean, I've learned a lot from the internet uh, through meetings and, you know, those uh, online classes and online uh, conferences that happen outside India. And I'm so informed, I get informed and I, uh, whenever there's a seminar, large seminar, basically in experimental, I'm, ve I'm very much into the programs and all. And I, I, uh, whenever there's a curatorial talk or the, the artists come from different parts of the world in experimental and they have a wonderful program out there and I get to their programs and join them like 
Uh, there are so many people from last year. They came from documentary. Yeah, e Experimenter seems to be the one gallery that keeps itself very much on the map yeah. in Kolkata. Yeah. So, so uh, that, uh, that actually helps, you know, uh, and the internet obviously helps. You can study a lot on the internet. You can uh, join these uh, mentor classes that happens in Experimenter and get yourself a little bit educated and updated with what's happening latest in Europe or America and whatever. Right, right, right. So are you doing well? Do you feel as an artist that you do well? You know, in I guess I'm, if you want to take that as a question about financially or just psychologically, are you happy being an artist or do you yes, find there's too many happy. problems? Very happy, very happy financially and uh, otherwise as a working artist. Of course, okay, good. So and you're I'm, doing well for yourself. Gita yeah. sells things for you. I'm getting really enriched. <laughs> enriched spiritually? <laughs> spiritually enriched? No. Well, good for you. I mean, I always find, you know, artists who say they don't want to talk about money or think about money. It's like, you need money to survive, you know? Yes, it's a lot of work. Money. Uh, whenever I uh, talk to uh, my colleagues and I give uh, these kind of talks within college, or uh, I'm invited in different meetings, uh, like, you know, artist talks, I always talk about money and tell them that I have to design a product. And that product has to be in such a good condition that you'll have to uh, bring out the money from the buyer's pocket and you have to get it. Otherwise, who will finance you? Yeah, I think a problem in so many art schools is they're very focused on teaching yes. the technique and the ideas and the concepts. But many people never really get told, unless it's from the outside, it's like basically you're creating a small business. Yes. You're creating a small business and you have to find some way to succeed as a small business. Yes, because you know, you know, whenever they're teaching Rembrandt, they are not actually teaching about his financial condition. Whenever they're teaching Rubens, they're not taking, talking about how we used to do business with the courts and different kings and you know, the courts and how we used to do business. That's the lacking thing. And that actually destroys most of the younger artists because they actually don't know how to manage finance. Right. That's a very difficult thing. Right. I mean, even like basic accounting. I mean, even I had to go through, well, I guess everybody did. But when GST came in, I was pulling out my hair. You know, I was telling my accountant, I was like, this is driving me crazy, especially at first, because they had you filing like three GST reports a month or something. I was like, I don't have time to do art anymore. <laughs> But, you know, the more you do it and then like the rules change and now it's much easier and I can handle it, you know, but anyway. So, so is there anything else you want to talk about? Because, uh, I want to talk about like in my academic career during my master's, I did a wonderful dissertation. I had to do a dissertation. Uh, we used to have to do a dissertation and I did a dissertation about semiotics. Science. Okay. Uh, semiotics and uh, so you want to talk about semiotics a little bit explain what that is well actually what we, I learned I, I, had to, I had to learn those from the internet because that at that time uh, in 2008 7 8 I didn't have the proper books at the time and I had to study mostly from the uh, secondhand books and and at the time I was reading Arnold Hauser uh, and uh, how uh, sign making becomes an uh, important thing. And uh, I had designed my uh, dissertation upon, like most of the teachers couldn't read my painting because they used to say that uh, you're, you're giving too much information. Why, why do you need to give too much information? Why don't you clean up? 
clean up the canvas and give a limited well your paintings do give a lot of sensory <laughs> overload i mean i mean they're a bit psychedelic <laughs> And but I think that's, for me, that's part of my fascination with them is that you, you can just keep exploring them with your eye again and again. And that, I was actually enjoying it and most of my teachers were saying that you need to clean it up. And on the other hand, uh, I had a wonderful teacher, uh, Deepak Bhattacharya, who, who used to teach us Chinese art. And he told me that you do whatever you like. If you want to give too much of information, fill it up with lots of information and see what happens. And slowly I was uh, reading about grand narrative, meta narrative, the theory part. And I was not actually reading too much of it because you can't actually apply and you can't actually use it and in a practical way. But I was getting informed and this dissertation this actually helped me. And, and at that time I was looking at Atul Dadiya's uh, Shaptapodi. There was an exhibition in Padera, I think. Okay, more. Yeah, the shop right. shutter works. Yes, yes. Shop yeah, shutter. I love those. And there was a, no, this was a different one, Shaptapoti series. Uh, Shaptapoti oh. is, I think, in 2005 or six. Okay, I don't know if I'm aware Badera, of that. Badera. It was in Badera, and I was very much in, inspired by David Saleh and uh, uh, Sigmar Polke and... Uh, and I was reading Neo Roche, a uh, German painter, and okay. how they were using the socialist realism idiom. And they were turning it, they were using it as a sign, uh, socialist realism. And at that time, I really understood how these things they were using, Neo Roche and uh, Mark Tansy, for example. And these were very enriching, and uh, I had designed my dissertation uh, with an uh, interview of two uh, theoreticians and theory class teachers of mine, uh, Shomik Nandi Madhundar and Parvez Kabi. They were the teachers at the time, and they were, I was asking every teacher that, you know, what do you think about my painting? Are they postmodern? Are they modern paintings? What? What, how do you read them? Do, you, do I need to clean them up? Uh, what do you think about the lots of information that I'm giving you? Uh, uh, are they readable? And that was a very interesting way of interviewing people and developing a book and there's a dissertation. And that actually helped me in opening up and how to understand how to understand sign making, semiotics, and all these things. Yeah, because there's a lot of symbolism in your work. Yes, yes. And, really and there's the, a lot of vernacularism in your work, too. There's a lot of vernacular. And at the time, I was seeing how my grandmother's sari, you know, the sari she was wearing, I found that she, they had paisley motifs, the typical Indian design, paisley motifs of a leaf, along with uh, Mickey Mouse okay. woven, into, uh, woven into a one single sari on a loom and I was so uh, that was a very enriching things and I keep on collecting these archives I mean with Mickey uh, Mouse yes Mickey Mouse with Paisley motifs and it was woven in a uh, weaver's loom you know when I first came to India I was shocked to find Mickey Mouse on so many like plastic items you would find in the bazaar. And that's when I had Srinu as my assistant and I'd send Srinu to the bazaar to buy a bucket or something. And I'd always say, don't buy anything with Mickey Mouse on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, I was collecting, I'm collecting all these odd things where you see juxtaposition of different languages or different uh, realities. And uh, these things keep, and I'm staying over here before, after uh, passing out from Shantanagatan, I went to Baroda to stay over there. And I stayed there for two months, but I realized that I was actually trying to address these uh, typical, you know, Bengali low pro art type cultures, which are very prevalent in my area. Because right. 
in my area where i stay in the outskirts of calcutta uh, i shifted later i used to um, okay. market in kolkata but later now my home and studio is a little bit 27 kilometers away from kolkata and uh, over here i'm staying in a place where uh, two five kilometers ahead is a danish colony it was a denmark colony from denmark and Five kilometers back, the it was a Dutch colony, Chandernagar. Uh, uh, sorry, it was a French colony. So okay. I was I'm staying over here in two former colonies within a space, and they are dotted and filled with lots of this kind of buildings and the huge figures who actually helped in the Bengal Renaissance, like William Carey. William Carey uh, was from I think I believe he came from Denmark. I no I think he came from England and uh, the king of Denmark actually uh, financed this huge colonial type of architecture it was it's a college now William Carey College and he had lots of influential uh, like the uh, uh, education system for girls and all these things and you have you have like such a wealth of material to draw from because yes. you've got the christian you know yes. heritage or i want to say mythology and you've got hinduism to draw from then you got victorian bric-a-brac yes. and you've got you know the things you find in the bazaar i mean that's one thing i love about kolkata whenever i've been there which i haven't been to kolkata as much as i've been to other places in india but it's like god there's such a wealth of material there visual material to work with and you know i've often thought i mean i would love to have my studio in kolkata actually i would love it because i love kolkata but um i die i wilt in the humidity you know i really like the desert here just because there's no humidity <laughs> lots of humidity over here Yeah. And, uh, uh, over there, in a, in a solo show, there was a uh, painting, large painting, based on his Victoria Memorial. There was an uh, exhibition of Kalinga paintings in the Victoria Memorial, and that was an interesting thing because uh, the display was in such a manner that the hall, in a small hall, they had segregated a uh, specific place, and uh, within the huge viceroy. sculptures in white marble the uh, the kaliga uh, paintings were displayed in such a manner it was humorous i mean when i encountered it it was so funny to see the uh, viceroy standing and within them the kaliga paintings had been displayed. the juxtaposition yes. which brings up a current issue i mean i do want to talk about this because it's come up yes. on facebook so much and that is in the west the tearing down of sculptures that are considered to be yes. colonial or racist or whatever it's and actually so, during huh? the marxist time and uh, during the marxist time they actually did it like uh, in kolkata they had a large number of sculptures of these viceroy throughout running throughout the uh, area not only in victoria memorial but around the campus uh, beyond the campus there were very good sculptures of uh, famous sculptures and so have they been removed for a long yes, time yes, now yes, yes they have been removed to garakku cantonment area and that okay. treasure trove and that has been removed and i'm not at all happy because you can't deny the colonial history you have to accept it and you have to say that okay it happened in certain area there were obviously uh, it had good effects as well as bad effects and you have to accept it you can't erase it how can you erase it you well it's for it's for indians and the people of kolkata to make those decisions somebody was pointing out there's still a statue of queen victoria in kolkata somewhere and was questioning whether or not it should be torn down I don't have an opinion one way or the other. I always find it rather odd that there's still these Victorian statues in India. But then conversely, if you separate them from the history, they're beautiful art objects. Yes. And I think most people when they see these sculptures in the parks are just like, what's well, a beautiful sculpture? They don't even yes. know who it is many times. But it's a beautiful sculpture, so it adds to some in some way it adds to the enjoyment of living in the urban space yes at the time i documented uh, i i was very excited to see those victoria 
Calibert paintings, and they were actually borrowed from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And uh, they had traveled here, and I was so excited that, yes, I could work with them. I documented all the sculptures of Victoria, Victoria feeding. I mean, uh, there were figures within and around Victoria Memorial. I documented them about famine, about uh, commerce, there are different iconographies, um, stone sculptures as well as bronze sculptures, and they are so beautiful. And I documented them and studied the history of Cornwallis and different ben Lord Benting and all those. And I juxtaposed them and I juxtaposed them with uh, Indian iconographies. And they actually, it's a way of democratic way of keeping different languages together within one painting you are juxtaposing different languages and keeping and you are actually saying that it's okay to live and to live harmoniously yes there are contradictions obviously it was an exploitative way of propaganda like the famine uh, sculpture well the thing i find interesting is a lot of people who are you know hinting that the victorian monuments in india should be taken away no, they, we still live. We still with a, live with a lot of Mughal monuments <laughs> throughout <laughs> India. You know, so so sometimes it depends how far do you want to go back in history. Yes. You know, and I think at certain point, you know, monuments just become or sculptures, whatever they just become part of the architectural artistic fabric of the society. You know, yes. and I uh, I did that painting like Victoria Kalighat exhibition, Kalighat painting exhibition in Victoria Memorial Hall. And after that, uh, no, when I moved out of Kolkata and we settled down here, yeah, over here, and it's, uh, over here it's a suburb, uh, not that urban kind of thing, but uh, I had a garden of my own and I started harvesting brinjals and, and typical kitchen garden kind of thing. And I was, I'm very, uh, you know, lured by the concept of I'm growing things, gardens, class and all. And I started nice. gardening and at that time uh, uh, Farmville uh, online game started popping up in Facebook. And I was so excited that okay I can I am harvesting in real life and I can harvest in um, the cyber generated space and it's so I can, I can take down photos of my uh, garden at, at the same time I can take out photos of these games and playing with actual farms that I'm building in digitally on the internet and I actually did that kind of thing and I started playing these kind of games and taking down photos and, and juxtaposing them with the real garden around me and there's a farmer farmer's market near my place and yeah. I started uh, documenting the wrappers of insecticides and pesticides, what kind of graphic designs they have. You're really full of energy. <laughs> You're, how old are you? Can I ask your age? I'm 39 now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's still the age of energy, so that's fine. You'll slow down when you hit your 50s a little bit. <laughs> so, um, And that, that kind of thing started... Uh, and uh, most of my paintings I do, I create a folder and I start uh, building up an archive for that image. And I started, for that painting, I started collecting paintings on food like the Dutch masters, the Dutch still lives, how they painted and the, how they conceptualized a, a food bowl and why they painted it. I started learning their history and how they painted food. And I, at the time, at the at that same time, I was talking to my friends who were actually bio biotech engineers and uh, all those uh, insect, though, those actually are uh, scientists who are actually uh, dealing with, you know, uh, biotechnology and all those things. And okay. so I was talking to them about BT brinjals and how they affect and Monsanto, how they affect the seed all this is politics and from that I drew a painting based on the farm bill farm. I think I remember that painting because I remember one of your paintings had a big Monsanto in it. You have to send me that image. Listen, this is getting too long, so I'm going to cut it because otherwise people don't watch if they get too long. 
So, but thank you, Honor Bon, and uh, I'm just going to say goodbye to the audience, and then we'll chat a little more, okay? So anyway, this is Wazo X Wazo Evil O from Udaipur talking with Honor Bon Mitra. Say goodbye, Honor Bon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.